We now begin the panel of research papers of this conference. This is the third panel of the conference and will be chaired by Professor Cynthia Lucas Hewitt, Associate Professor, Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia. Can I please request you to come on stage? All the speakers to please come on stage. Navyu Gill, Assistant Professor, William Patterson University, USA. Babak Amini, PhD candidate, London School of Economics. C. Sarachan, Assistant Professor, Satyavati College, Delhi. And Spencer Leonard, Visiting Faculty, University of Tennessee, USA. Can I please request our chair to take over the proceedings? Yes, thank you. So I would, on behalf of the, of the ADRI conference, I'd like to welcome you to the panel for four, four papers, um, papers 9 through 12. And um, I welcome my colleagues to the table here. Uh, I look forward to hearing your papers. And uh, I think we will follow up. We have, let's see, two hours, and uh, you are four, so I think um, maybe 20 minutes apiece. Is that reasonable? I'm at 25. You're at 25. Yeah. Because, yeah, try to leave about 15 minutes, since we have four of you. Um, and the dialogue probably would be really good. So I think we'll proceed in the order of the um, we'll, in the order of the program, and we will begin with this, with Professor Gill from William Patterson University in the USA. Um, and I will let you also state the title of your talk, please. Uh, okay, can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay, uh, hello. Sat Sri Akal, Ate Lal Salam. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here, uh, part of this conference uh, on Marx's bicentenary um, in the birthplace of Guru Gobind Singh. Um, I want to thank Adri, uh, Dr. Desai, um, and especially Neeraj, uh, Sandeep, Suraj, Setaka, uh, Aditi, and the rest of the team here, they've done an amazing job uh, in welcoming us um, and putting on this event. Um, also, thanks to the staff at uh, the Hotel Moria. They've been efficient and gracious. Um, before I begin, um, uh, I should say that I'm a historian of modern South Asia. Uh, my work is on uh, caste, labor, and agrarian politics in colonial Punjab. Uh, so what I'm going to share today is um, a portion of a chapter of the book I'm working on, which is about the division of labor in the countryside in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, it is uh, sort of steeped in archival research and historiographical debates, uh, but I hope it's sort of broad enough to generate a wider discussion. Um, I should also maybe signal three themes that, that occur in the paper that... Um, you know, we might help kind of think through. Um, the first is colonial benevolence. Uh, the second is the production of expectations. Uh, and the last is uh, thinking about Marx in the colony. Okay, so central to the British claim of bringing progressive rule to South Asia was taxation, the rational determination and collection of the government's share of produce from agricultural activity. As both a reason and the means for colonialism, land revenue constituted an elementary bond between sovereign and subject. Nowhere was a careful and considerate revenue policy more pronounced in the empire than during the conquest and administration of Punjab. An early report from its first chief commissioner in 1854 succinctly articulates this logic. Quote, when it is remembered that this tax furnishes three-fourths of the state's resources, and that it is paid by agriculturalists comprising three-fourths of the population, 
that their contentment and happiness is more vitally affected by the manner in which this tax is levied and administered than by any other circumstance whatsoever, the extreme importance of the subject is manifest." End quote. For colonial officials, the Punjabi peasant was exceptional for being a simple cultivator proprietor. Since this group appeared to both hold and till the bulk of cultivatable land, concern for a revenue policy in its interest was seen as a genuine effort to bring the benefits of an enlightened economic order to a hapless population. Now this stands in sharp contrast to other regions where earlier the colonial state imposed much more aggressive and arbitrary processes for collecting revenue. Through the permanent settlement in Bengal or the Zamindari settlement in North India, officials admittedly sought to ensure stability and profit by empowering large absentee landlords to the detriment of poor subordinate tenants. A considerable body of scholarship has documented how these policies brought both economic and social turmoil, leading to mass impoverishment, famine and starvation. Now, what is significant about the claim of progressive rule in Punjab is not merely its inaccuracy or its hypocrisy, but the ways in which it has shaped understandings of the politics of agrarian change in colonial capitalism. The bulk of contemporary histori historiography focuses on the benevolence of British revenue collection, how they explicitly favored the peasantry, promoted agricultural development, and thereby limited economic dislocation. Together, these policies are seen to have reified feudal practices, beliefs, and hierarchies. Most scholars have thus argued that Punjab remained semi or quasi-feudal because colonial rule did not generate the kind of transformative upheavals it did elsewhere. Now, at the center of these readings is the disquieting notion that colonialism somehow betrayed its world historical mandate. Since this peasantry was neither rapaciously exploited nor displaced from the countryside, it seems the rule of capital went awry. It's almost as if there is regret that the various exigencies and deficiencies thwarted this unconscious tool of history from effectively creating a world after its own image. In the context of Punjab, such a perspective suggests a desire for a more robust, ambitious, and effective colonialism, one that should have taken seriously its responsibilities in order to properly transform a backward society. Yet I argue seeking such dynamism presupposes a lack of expected change and ends up equating the non-appearance of certain bourgeois relations with continuity of the archaic and the feudal. The problem with such a position is that it ignores how the operation of colonial rule, irrespective of its intent, infiltrated Punjabi society to disrupt and reorder social and economic relations while masking them as traditional. The primacy of the peasant in Punjab up to 1947 and beyond is inexplicable as simple continuation. In this paper, I excavate the logic of colonial benevolence through the politics of knowledge and culture to offer an alternative history of accumulation. I begin by tracing the making of a unique revenue policy through the techniques of surveying, measuring, and calculating agrarian potential. Next, I examine how the process generated a set of natural and human contingencies that transformed the meaning of the category peasant. In order to underline the importance of this difference, I then contrast the archive of settlement work with perhaps the paradigmatic account of the encounter between state and peasant in Europe, Marx's so-called primitive accumulation. Now, what this demonstrates is a politics of capital that goes beyond the given metrics of success and failure in order to open up new possibilities for thinking through the different histories and futures of the global south. Now, there's two sections, uh, one on the sort of unique frontier history of Punjab, uh, and then another section on how it became incorporated into the East India Empire. I won't read those. Uh, the next section, uh, a conspiracy of contingency. Perhaps the most significant expression of supposedly benevolent rule manifested in the production and application of knowledge about agrarian activity. A vital instrument in this process was the settlement report. Almost immediately after the East India Company's conquest in 1849, officers conducted expeditions throughout the countryside to examine, classify, and catalog the wealth of the province and its inhabitants. So there were three key uh, aspects to settlement operations. Uh, the first was to assess the physical characteristics of the land, especially soil quality, uh, drainage, and means of irrigation. This is whether the, sand was, uh, whether the soil was sandy or loomy, whether the 
whether it was irrigated by rainfall or canals or well water. The second was to establish taxation rates for the different types of crops grown based on their average yield and market price. So this was to determine how much wheat or cotton could be grown and what its price was in a given year. The last was to calculate the projected seasonal monetary output for each unit of land based on the soil, the irrigation, the crop grown, and the market value. So the result was that a British officer could determine that a particular parcel of land growing a specific crop was supposed to produce a given yield of which the state was entitled to a certain portion in the form of a cash equivalent. As you can tell, this was an incredibly laborious, invasive and disruptive process repeated in every village across all districts periodically for nearly a century. Yet for all the precision, rigor and sophistication of settlement, settlement equations, there remained aspects of agricultural production that escaped convenient quantification. On the one hand, soil quality might differ dramatically within a specific squared area. On the other hand, the availability of water could be erratic due to the changing course of rivers or irregular rainfalls. Officials continually grappled with the unwillingness of the earth to divide itself into neat grids and the refusal of the climate to deliver at scheduled times. Now beyond these contingencies, a more intractable element of production confounded settlement activity. The agriculturalists themselves. A short note by the Punjab government in 1865 reveals the contours of this problem. Quote, it frequently occurs that the heavier rates are paid by the more industrious villages and the lighter rates by their less skillful neighbors occupying lands of similar natural advantage. It is practically impossible to adjust inequalities of this nature and it is politically inexpedient to attempt to do so. The more skillful agriculturalists pay the higher rates with more ease than their less able neighbors, less able neighbors pay the lower rates and also after paying the higher rates have a much larger margin of profit left to them." End quote. So according to the colonial understanding of Punjabi society, agriculture was not conducted by generic equal agriculturalists differing only in the natural resources that happened to be available to them. Rather, the agriculturalists themselves differed in apparently essential, immutable ways. More so than earth and water, the collective identities of those cultivating a parcel of land profoundly affected its productive possibilities. As a result, perhaps the most important responsibility of a settlement officer was the observation, measurement, and categorization of human beings. Measuring men. Every settlement report contains sections discussing the particulars of those castes identified as agriculturalists. So I'm going to share descriptions from uh, three different districts um, uh, just to give a sense of, of, of what these uh, observations sounded like. Um, according to the settlement officer in Ludhiana district, the Muslim inhabitants of the northern portion are generally the worst of cultivators, deficient alike in skill and inclination a contrast to the widely superior skill in appliances used by the Hindu in the, in the southern parts. More specifically, this officer describes how the Hindu drives his plow with whip steadily applied, attended by his wife and children, weeding the soil and cleansing it from all hindrances. At the other end of the spectrum, the Muslim, with his family confined to the mud walls of his village, will urge the plow along with, perhaps, a hookah in the other hand, forgetting the labor he is undergoing in the charms of the drugs he is in. Now, along with religious identity, settlement officers also discussed how certain social practices produced better or worse agriculturalists. For the commissioner of Amritsar district, Jats were unequivocally superior. He writes that the Amritsar villages contain some of the finest specimens of man I have seen in any country. Yet another officer offered a more selective opinion. He writes, demographically, the mass of the agricultural population are Hindu Jats, about 50% of whom are Sikh, and about 12% who were formerly in the Sikh army of Ranjit Singh. Of this group, he goes on to explain, those who have not been in the military are thrifty, industrious, and honest. On the other hand, those who have been in the army are extravagant and make bad cultivators, and besides being litigious and false, are given to intoxication. Finally, in Ferozpur district, 
A settlement officer repeats this internal differentiation by summarily defining several castes in more explicit ways. The Muslim Doggers, Pattis and Gujars are utterly devoid of energy and are the most apathetic, unsatisfactory race of people. Muslim Rayans, on the other hand, are indeed first-rate cultivators, but at the same time, in general, they are, a they are a rather litigious and discontented set, much like some of the Jats in Amritsar. Many of the Machis, he adds, are addicted to thieving and therefore hopeless at agricultural pursuits. Sekbrars, though, have the potential to cultivate successfully as other Jats, but because they wear finer clothes and consider themselves a more illustrious race, their quality has gradually declined. Now, descriptions such as these, varying in degrees of contempt and esteem, exist for every caste considered to be agriculturalist throughout Punjab. A system of classifying people emerged in tandem with the classification of nature. And it was these evaluations that found their way into the colonial calculus for revenue responsibility. The subject of the settlement report, the person with whom the state settled the payment of revenue, was therefore also its object. Now, there's another section on how Punjabis, uh, different groups of Punjabis uh, dealt with settlement operations. Uh, I won't read it, but it was a sort of combination of evasion, of uh, adaptation, and of adoption. So ultimately, a different kind of knowledge about revenue produced through settlement activity allowed for a different practice of its extraction. The policy used the equations of the settlement officer to make a demand on the abstract value of a given field and its owner was calculated to be able to produce. Land combined with a quantity of labor and not what or how much actually grew upon it now acquired a definitive revenue potential. This invested property with a new meaning as ownership now meant obligations. So thus, by the late 1870s, a new relationship was forged through the discourse of benevolence, the practice of revenue collection, and the evaluation of the particular groups responsible for its payment. Now, what makes this history more than simply an interesting account of the idiosyncrasies of a particular region is when it is implicated in a wider global history of colonial capitalism. One way to make sense of settlement activity is by contrast with perhaps the most compelling narrative of the encounter between peasants and the modern state. The fate or fatality of the peasant in England is the conventional paradigm by which the difference of all other peasantries is brought to the fore. Karl Marx terms this encounter primitive accumulation and describes at least some of its secrets in the last few chapters of Capital Volume 1. Now, I should say uh, uh, here that I'm not uh, reading Marx as a historian. Um, the chapters uh, that I'm discussing actually occur at the end of Capital Volume 1, so he's obviously not making a kind of linear, sequential case uh, in his text. Um, moreover, many scholars, uh, historians of Europe have shown that agricultural relations in Europe didn't quite play out the way Marx describes. Uh, however, the, the power of Marx's narrative is how it has been taken to be the definitive account of the emergence of capital and what that means for the rest of us working on the colonial world. So crucial to uh, his process of accumulation was the double freeing of the rural agricultural population, loosening their dependence on the means of cultivation while denying them access to independent livelihoods. A brutal centuries-long onslaught, both legislative and corporeal, enclosed grazing, hunting, and foraging lands, seized public commons for conversion into private property, and confiscated large church estates. The result was the deracination of the peasantry, its nearly wholesale eviction from the countryside, and arrival in cities desperate to sell its own labor power for survival. For Marx, the making of the modern proletariat in England occurred through the unmaking of the English peasantry. It is this transformation of agrarian life that informs the coming of modernity. And it is this understanding of accumulation that generates a set of expectations for the histories of all other societies. Yet I argue this sardonic freeing of the peasantry occurred only at a particular conjuncture and through a very specific set of circumstances. 
the transformation of peasant into proletarian was based on a certain form of knowledge underwritten by the notion of equality between individuals and enacted through a series of state-backed separations. When we understand the peculiarity of the narrative of the dispossession of the peasant in Europe, the scene from Punjab therefore begins to look very different. So first is the source materials that bring such distinct historical subjects into light. While British officers are hardly univocal in their descriptions of rural Punjabi society, there is none of the simmering, polarizing resentment between bourgeoisie and aristocracy that produced knowledge about agricultural conditions in England. So this is a kind of side uh, argument, but as, as many of us know, uh, Marx relies on the Blue Books, the yearly collection of parliamentary papers, royal commissions, and official publications uh, named for the color of the hardcover within which they were bound. Um, if you look at the chapter on the working day in particular, uh, he uses various reports of the inspectors of factories, uh, several children's employment commissions, and the series of factory acts, all sponsored by the rural aristocracy, to describe the misery, degradation, and exploitation of the new working class. At the same time, Marx also conveys a parallel account of squalor and suffering in the countryside using uh, two public health reports, uh, a few reports from the poor law inspectors, and articles from the Morning Chronicle newspaper, all sponsored by the urban bourgeoisie. So if you trace the footnotes, it's the tension between these two groups that produces knowledge about conditions both in the countryside and in the cities. In the colony, however, officers of a despotic state work together to govern a supposedly backward population through a program of civilizing economics. The kinds of activities they engaged in through revenue settlement, studies of soil, of irrigation, of crop patterns, and the quality of information they produced, revenue rates, and the singular caste responsible for their payment, is unlike anything found in Europe. Second, when Marx or Kotsky or Hegel or Rousseau or Adam Smith or any other 19th century commentator speaks about the peasant of Europe, they do so with a largely ecumenical vocabulary. Whatever qualities they ascribe to a peasant, lazy, cunning, irrational, stubborn, it stands in for all peasants. There is a presumption of equality, or at least homogeneity, which lumps together almost everyone in the countryside, perhaps in anticipation of the uniformity of factory labor. The mix of disdain, and concern English officials exhibited towards English peasants, however, is apart from the contempt, pity, and fear company officers had towards their newly conquered subjects. Whatever the defects of an English peasant, they are not fanaticism, bigotry, or a warlike character. In the colonial vocabulary for Punjab, this peasantry is in fact riven with permanent differences, both petty and profound. Some peasants are much lazier than others. Some are inclined to work harder. Others are quick to become violent or litigious. Others still are addicted to thieving, gambling, or intoxication. Perceived cultural distinctions of caste and religion in particular thereby became implicated in the political economy of Punjabi society. Third, there is a significant departure in the operations of the state in either situation. Throughout the struggle between the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy, the English state eventually came to facilitate an accumulation based on a series of separations. Customary practices were abolished, new methods of expropriation were legitimized, and a distinct system of discipline emerged, all premised on the dislocation of the peasantry. Yet for the Punjab administration, wary of any kind of instability, the separation and movement of peoples was to be avoided at all costs. Instead, in a diametrically opposite way, I show how their accumulation was an exercise of various attachments. Parcels of land were marked and boundaries fixed. The market value of crops established and the population formally enumerated, all towards assigning certain individuals with the duality of ownership rights and revenue responsibilities. Preventing displacement thereby actively reordered the rural population into a new set of productive relations. So from this vantage then, the notion of the colonial obstruction of capital begins to dissipate. Uh, 
Indeed, the deceptiveness of the question of whether or not the British were benevolent toward the peasant lies in this. An affirmative or negative answer is based on the same premise, that of the progressiveness of colonialism. At the same time, the critique of benevolence has little to do with demonstrating simple malevolence. That sort of gesture only oscillates between the given terms of the debate while leaving their thematic opposition intact. By provincializing the narrative of accumulation, the difference of the Punjabi peasant is neither simply compared nor rendered incomparable to Europe. Rather, through giving that difference a history, the very burden of expectation for similarity is lifted. It thus becomes possible to recognize that the peasant that emerged after the first few decades of British rule was irreducibly distinct and modern. This peasant was forged through a new relationship with a powerful bureaucratic and disciplinary state. It followed a production cycle based on perpetual increase and expansion, and it adopted the abstraction of cash payment bound to the exclusivity of ownership. Perhaps most uniquely, its economic performance was implicated in the evaluation of its cultural and social practices, which in turn came to generate new forms of exclusion. During the ensuing century of colonial rule, through an accumulation of attachment rather than separation, it is this peasant that came to occupy a dominant position within rural Punjabi society. By attending to the political economy of these differences, we are thus able to both explore the aleatory quality of Marx's writings in the colony, as well as the unpredictable history of a much deeper, longer, and opaque relationship of domination and subordination in the countryside. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gill. Um, I did not give any introduction. Let me briefly say that he has received his PhD from Emory University, and currently he's working on a book manuscript entitled Labors of, Labors of Division, Caste, Class, and Politics of Hierarchy in Colonial India, which explores the emergence of both landholding peasants and landless laborers. Uh, let me briefly also introduce our next speaker, um, Baba Kamini is a PhD candidate in sociology at the, at the London School of Economics. Uh, he is a member of the editorial board of Socialism and Democracy. Among his forthcoming recent publications are edited books, in particular Handbook of Marx's Capital, A Global History of, Trans of Translation, and The Radical Left in Europe in the Age of Austerity. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, uh, both in the front line and the, the background, uh, for all the uh, incredible work that they've been uh, putting into this uh, wonderful conference. Am I close enough? Oh, okay. All right. Is it good? All right, good. Um, my title is called uh, on, on the history of Marxist capital. This on is important because I'm not going to give you the history of Marxist capital. It's, a, it's more of a methodological consideration of writing the history of Marxist capital. And now, um, I know it's the third day, and uh, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like uh, this. You know, the first day, ready to go, and uh, the third day, I'm kind of collapsing. So I'm trying to make it as uh, swift as possible uh, so we can continue this marathon. Uh, okay, so last night actually I was going through the, uh, the presentation preparing a little bit and I stumbled upon this absolutely wonderful quote by one and only famous entrepreneur uh, Elon Musk who tweeted last night uh, this. He said, Marx was a capitalist. He even wrote a book about it. And he qualified <laughs> that by saying, and I don't trust that Engels guy. He could have written, uh, made up uh, most of second and third volume. Nobody actually knows. So uh, I would like here to officially thank uh, Elon Moss for his generous and timely idiocy for providing me with this wonderful quote here. So with this, I uh, would like to continue the presentation. So in this presentation, I would like to uh, 
make an argument for the importance of dissemination studies in the contemporary study of Marx and Marxism. For that, I'll offer a general definition of the dissemination studies and compare it with the translation studies. In exploring its importance within political science, I'll uh, point out uh, the way Antonio Gramsci theorized about the relation between politics and translation and use that approach to suggest that uh, dissemination studies are best understood as essentially a Gramscian project within Marxism. In the second part of the presentation, I'll uh, give a general overview of the current project that Professor Musto and I have been uh, working on for the last two years to trace the global history of Marxist capital in the world. Dissemination studies uh, can be defined as the study of translations and editions of a work in a socio-political context within which the, they emerge. Translation study is a relatively new field that has been struggling to present itself as a discipline. Since dissemination and translation studies share important characteristics in common, in one way one can say translation study is a subset of dissemination studies. I start with a general, a very general overview of translation studies and then contrast it with dissemination studies. Some of the first works on uh, translation study came out in the 1950s and 1960s. In its early form, it was mainly interested in uh, the development and application of theories of translation through schools of uh, thought such as uh, equivalence theory, scopus theory, cultural theory, and so on. There are obvious similarities between translation and dissemination studies. Uh, they both uh, necessarily and essentially a comparative and uh, multidisciplinary study. They both look at linguistic transformation of the text and the dynamics that govern such linguistic movements. Yet there are crucial differences between them. Dissemination studies can go beyond the study of various translation and also look at propagation of the text through different editions or even a single edition through different reprints. Uh, in fact, dissemination studies pay significant attention to various editions and reprints. Dissemination study is also less focused on the philological or philosophical questions regarding the nature of translation and more acutely aware and interested in uh, politics of translation and dissemination. The discussion of relation between politics and translation had implicitly existed within translation study, but it gained more prominence, especially upon the cultural turn in the 1990s, uh, 80s and 90s. These were linked to the studies of ideology, postcoloniality, and minority studies. Because of the centrality of social political uh, context and the driving mechanism behind the dissemination of a particular work, dissemination studies can also investigate the negative spaces in which translation have been acutely absent. These, uh, this feature makes it particularly appropriate for post-colonial and minority studies of the movement of ideas. In post-colonial studies, the discussion focuses on how the translation was tangled up with the uh, colonial process and legacy. Minority study looks at uh, how translation may affect the power relation between the minorities and the majority groups. Given its interest in the movement of ideas, dissemination studies uh, are tightly linked to studies of interpretations and receptions. It looks at reception not merely as a, his, as, a, as a history of theoretical interpretation or elaboration, but also as a pedagogical and adaptive processes. Therefore, even though there are strong affinities between these two fields of studies, translation and dissemination, they are not simply reducible to one another. Unfortunately, political science has yet to properly, properly utilize the full potential of dissemination studies in its field. Some attention has been given within sociology, but it has largely been limited to a sociological analysis of translation process rather than using dissemination studies to understand sociological processes themselves. Now, the politics of uh, dissemination, understanding the politics of dissemination requires an examination of various processes that are tangled up in the, uh, the translation, pro production, and pro uh, propagation of the text. It's not just the political and ideological uh, disposition of the translator or the publisher as the individuals, 
who are examined, the dissemination studies should operate at three analytic levels. Uh, namely individuals, institutions, both formal and informal, and the state. The individual at the individual level, dissemination studies do record the political link and motivation behind agents involved in the process of dissemination, most notably the translators. However, given the fact that majority of these agents are part of various organizations, it is by no means straightforward to deduce the way their individuality plays into the dissemination process. More research needs to be done to find out the, the degree to which these agents assume uh, subordination to these institutional concerns and how their margin of freedom is reflected into the uh, dissemination process. It is worth noting that the, at the individual la level, activist translators are especially important in the politics of dissemination as they're often engaged in counter-hegemonic process. At the institutional level, depending on the structural configuration of the organization, the dissemination process goes through a set of norms, policies, and ideologies enforced by the institutional setup. Of course, this does not necessarily entail the total subordination of the process to the institutional constraint, but shapes it in various ways. I just referred to uh, the wonderful uh, presentation that uh, Prashant Dadar gave uh, on the, uh, the United Front and reading of Marx as an example of how at the institutional level you can study the disseminations and the relation with the institutional setup and configurations. At the state level, uh, translation processes are rendered through translation policies of the state. Even though each might follow different regimes, all modern states have some kind of translation policies. The translation policy of the state is especially important with regards to the state's relation with the minorities within the nation states. Another essential aspect of state for the dissemination process is censorship policies, of course, which can fundamentally alter the landscape of propagation. Furthermore, the ideological commitment and linkages to the state and its position within the suprastate networks also affect the way these policies are formulated and therefore affect the dissemination of the text. Now, each of these uh, analytic levels should always be contextualized within the local, regional, national, and international spheres. Therefore, the dynamics of textual movement can only be understood at three analytic levels within the, the, the uh, contextual manifold. The text itself is not always entirely passive in all of this. The merit and relevance of its content and the style of its uh, historical and conceptual uh, sorry, and uh, its style and its historical and conceptual links to other texts can also play an important role in the way the dissemination of that, take, that text uh, unfolds. Now, one of the most important thinkers in Marxist tradition who reflected deeply on translation was uh, Antonio Gramsci. He, uh, his most elaborate writings on translation can be found in his prison notes books especially notebook, notebook 11. Despite a fragmentary and incomplete nature, uh, Gramsci's theoretical elaboration on translation lays the foundation, I think, for a Marxist paradigm for, uh, of Marxist paradigm for dissemination studies. He saw translation not as a one-to-one -one transfer of information from one language to another, but as praxis. He defines praxis in notebook 7 very simply as the relationship between human will, superstructure, and the economic structure. That was a quote. If he also uh, later on elevates the relation between translation and praxis significantly in notebook 11, where he says, quote, it seems that one may in fact say that uh, only in the philosophy of praxis is the translation organic and complete. Understanding the process of translation through prism of philosophy of praxis, Gramsci generalizes the theory of translation from mere text to also practices. Now, translatability for him is not limited to the question of text uh, uh, in different languages, but the practices in different social political cultures as well. Therefore, he elevates the question of translation to a central concern within Marxism. He can we can already see uh, some of this uh, early stages of this thought when he was writing on the Turin uh, 
factory cancels and how he was contemplating on to the extent and the way uh, the Russian Soviet experience can be translated into the Italian experience. As L uh, Rocco Latour puts it, quote, Gramsci acknowledges how, in reality, the relation among linguistic structures express more profound dialectic reciprocal actions, that is, social, political, historical interactions across time, time and space. In Gramscian model of translatability, uh, what involves uh, as the conditions of the possibility of making one national culture translatable in terms of another is similarities between structures of the two societies. Accordingly, translation is, not, is an act of descending through superstructure to the structure of a society in language one to then ascend once again through the structure into the surface of the, the second language. It seems that uh, what Gramsci, Gramscian model implies with regards to translatability is a form of commensurability of structures and superstructures uh, between the, the, the two cultures or two languages where the translation takes place. However, given the fact that for Gramscian structures and superstructures are dialectically related, the problem of impossibility of translation, and this is related to the, you know, the difficulties of capital, for example, for translation, is not straightforward at all. Translation is an active process that can shape superstructure itself through creating hegemonic or counter-hegemonic discourses. Therefore, as we have it in note Notebook 10, Gramsci's uh, theory of translation is intimately linked to his conception of hegemony, insofar as translation is part of the pedagogical project of the communist education of the masses. As part of the uh, knowledge production, the act of translation have, uh, can have a revolutionary function. It can inst initiate an ethical political mo movement to transcend the constraints of the structure by transforming the superstructure. He uses the term catharsis for the emancipatory potential of translation. In Notebook 10, uh, Gramsci writes, quote, the term catharsis can be employed to indicate the passage from purely economic to the ethical political moment that is superior elaboration of the structure into superstructure in the minds of men. This seems the passage from objective to subjective and from necessary to freedom. Structure sees to be an external force which crushes man, assimilates him to itself and makes him passive and is transformed into a means of freedom, an instrument to create a new ethical political form and a source of new initiative. To establish a cathartic movement becomes, therefore, the starting point of all philosophy of praxis. End of quote. This cathartic movement as a struggle for hegemony and collective will may head towards a creation of a historic bloc. The Gramscian model, uh, I think, offers a useful paradigm for dissemination studies, understanding translation as a generalizable uh, praxis deeply politicizes the process of translation without treating politics as an external force and reducing it uh, to study of ideologies and enables the, the dissemination studies to locate the context at the center of the analysis. If it is true that Gramsci's model theorizes translation as politics and politics as translation, then one can say dissemination study in turn historicizes the two-sided conception. In short, Gramscian studies, sorry, trans dissemination study is a Gramscian project. What this positive outlook on the emancipatory potential of translation, however, misses, in my opinion, is the uh, ideological, repressive, and hegemonic count hegemonically counter-revolutionary aspects of translation process. These negative aspects come forth when we look at the dissemination of a work in those various levels of analysis and scopes of contextualization. It is therefore a dialectic tension between the translation, within the translation process that contains a cathartic movement for sure, but also a whimpering movement. <laughs>
Whether the contradiction is resolved positively or negatively depends on the social political context and the balance of hegemonic forces involved in the translation process. I was going to give an example of the former Yugoslavia and how introduction of a translator, interpreter, was actually a way to project the image of fragmentation intentionally. But uh, I simply refer to the brilliant talk that uh, Craig uh, Brandes gave on the, the Marxist Oriental Studies in USSR and how the state policies affect the way you know, the institutions that carry out you know, translations uh, uh, you know, uh, are affected and, and, and changed. Now, the next part of the, the talk which is, I promise, shorter than the first part and lighter, uh, is on one, the book that uh, we have been uh, working on for the last two years, putting together this large, massive history of Marxist capital around the world, everywhere. And, um, but I thought maybe I should start with the uh, reception of Marx in one of the most conservative journals, The Economist. And if you read their headlines, they have moved from denial to acceptance uh, from headlines reading, the collapse of communism was comprehensive and ignominious. Is there still value in Marx's idea? All the way to now, Marx's idea about monopolies, rent seeking, and casual labors are more relevant than they have been for decades. So we have a reception, a progressive reception of Marx seems, it seems in uh, The Economist. But let's go to the more deeper um, history of capital here. The purpose of this uh, volume is to reconstruct the history of dissemination and reception of Marxist capital throughout the world, providing a more exhaustive account of the formation of Marxism that has previously been offered. Several prestigious Marxist <clears throat> historians, including Eric Hobsbawm, have often wished for the production of a more concrete study on the dissemination of Marxist writing in order to provide a more historically grounded definition of a political ideology called Marxism. <clears throat> uh, Professor Musto has uh, done similar works in the past on uh, Manifesto and the Grundrisse, looking at the dissemination and their history of dissemination. Um, the different characteristics of this text, Manifesto as the ideological text, the Grundrisse as the neglected text, and uh, Capital as the mature scientific text, a result in a profoundly different historiography of the formation of Marxism using dissemination studies. This book consists of 52 chapters uh, written by 66 authors covering uh, 75 languages. The contributors have been uh, asked to provide a short history of the penetration of Marxism in their country, narrate the story of different translation of capital, critically analyze the timing of translation in relation to other, Marx's other works, Manifesto, Grundrisse, etc. Write about the reception of capital for, uh, from both political and theoretical perspectives and uh, evaluate the importance of capital in terms of the overall understanding of Marxism and more broadly socialism. Now given the difficulty in translating and interpreting capital, we have been quite attentive to the silences to the negative spaces where capital has not been disseminated. That is the, the, the place where there have, there have been a, a Marxism without capital or capital has been disseminated by other means like partial uh, editions or, or comp compendium. The most uh, notable example of this, is the, of this country is African continent where a legacy of colonial hegemony is evident. In all African languages, capital has been translated only into Americ and Swahili. In many cases, to compensate for the unavailability of archival uh, documents of, in reading capital, we had to go uh, by the African intellectuals, we had to resort to oral histories, uh, and, you know, interviewing uh, the activists, the polit political activists, the, the theorat uh, theoretician, etc., and so remembering the reading of capital. We have also paid particular attention to significant partial edition, especially for those circulations where the full, uh, the full translation did not exist. Uh, I can name like uh, Urdu translation in Pakistan and Filipino translation in the Philippines. They are both partial editions. Particular attention has been given to state sponsor uh, dissemination projects around capital. The paradigm example is, of course, uh, Soviet Union, 
which sponsored uh, transitional capital in 30 languages and the Chinese states in seven languages. Generally, one can decipher at least four dynamics uh, operating underneath the dissemination of capital. Attempts by individual activists and scholars, for example, the Sri Lankan uh, uh, example, Attempts initiated as part of a larger political organization, I can name Hebrew translation as part of the kibbutz movement. The uh, uh, projects driven by institutions, for example, the academic institution in, the, in Japan, and state-sponsored projects like Soviet Union and China. These dynamics in different periods, uh, in different periods are, uh, are uh, also dependent on the regional and the, the, the country uh, specific uh, dimensions. The, the, the general trends uh, I end here is the, the global trend with co which corresponds to key economic and political events. For example, there is a vague correlation between the economic crises uh, uh, like in the, the la uh, late 19th century, 1920s and 30s, 1970s and late 2000s, and the reprints and new editions of capital. You can see they move kind of together. The regional trends like Latin American and Arab world in the 1970s, and the local trends which have to do with their sort of internal politics of each country. Now all come together to sort of paint a very complex picture of the history of capital in the world. Just to wrap up, this is the way we are uh, sort of uh, partitioning the world uh, into 52 chapters. Uh, you can see that like, the colors show different ways we have uh, grouped uh, countries together. Um, Europe, you know, it was small, so I made it a little bit bigger. Now, India, because we are in India, I just showed a map that, of how we have uh, uh, looked at India, there are eight authors working on India, and we have, uh, you know, the languages where capital have, have been translated uh, uh, either fully or significant partial editions. Thank you very much for, oh, sorry, before I wrap up, got it. This one shows the, the table of translation of capital in all languages chronologically ordered based on the, the first volume. There have been 64 translation of capital. The volume one has been translated in 64 languages fully. In volume two is 58 and volume three is 52. And you can see the orders. I mean, if you want, I can send you this slide later. And uh, just last, very last thing, I promise, uh, just to show you the complexity of the project, we are not just looking at the first edition, uh, first edition, we are looking at all edition in all languages. So for example, Germany has many different language uh, editions of each volume. So the, in the chapters, we go into all of these and the history of all of them. Now, thank you very much for your time. I'd like to now introduce Mr. Saraklan, who has his research interests in political economy and heterodox, heterodox, excuse me, macro, macroeconomics. Um, and he looks at the relationship between exploitation and oppression, Marx's formulations on value. Uh, without wasting any time, I'll just get down to the thing. So my uh, paper is on exploitation and oppression under bourgeoisdom uh, because of uh, one word which may be unfamiliar to some, I'll be getting on to it when the paper is on. Okay, basically this paper is concerned with the relationship between exploitation and oppression, oppression being understood as caste, gender, race, communalism and so on. Uh, there was a view in the past, which we'll come to next, which said that actually these are secondary phenomena as far as get the capitalist mode of production is concerned. Uh, in this paper, I'm actually arguing that in a social formation, which I will define shortly, where the capitalist mode of production is dominant, exploitation and oppression presuppose each other. Okay. Now, I'm linking it to two phenomena, which I will discuss shortly. Okay. So there is a traditional view, I don't want to call it the traditional view, a traditional view of exploitation and oppression. Now it has been argued by some that social oppression is incompatible with full-fledged capitalist development. 
So you look at the party program of the CPIM, that is the Communist Party of India Marxist, adopted in 1964, it had actually faulted the Indian bourgeoisie for not dismantling the barriers posed by pre-capitalist society for the free development of capitalist society. Now this is, and there are many such other places where you can find this. Now it has been argued by others that exploitation explains the various forms of oppression. That is, exploitation comes first and oppression comes second. Uh, and there's a third component to this which basically says that as the capitalist mode of production develops, actually social oppression becomes less and less significant. Okay. Uh, if you look at the three volumes of capital, I'm talking about the standard volumes, uh, differences between workers were not considered significant, one can argue in that fashion, and such issues were to be taken up in a projected book on wage labor, which Marx could not write. Uh, a traditional view on exploited, exploitation and oppression may draw on some of the formulations of Marx, where he basically assumed that the rate of surplus value was equal across sectors, branches, etc. But however, Marx had discussed the role of unequal rates of surplus value in basically his uh, Mega 2, Part 2, Volume 4.3. Uh, it's in German. So, and I can't read German. So, but I was informed by Professor Fred Mosley that actually this was covered there. In one of his writings, he's mentioned thing. So, what I'm saying here is that unequal rates of exploitation, of surplus value, I'm sorry, is in, in each branch of production is connected to the unequal rates of exploitation of different types of workers. Okay. Now, besides simplicity, there is no reason to discuss, to assume that the rates of exploitation of different types of workers are equal. Now, those of you who are not comfortable with the maths can just skip through this. Basically, I'm trying to say that if there are two types of workers and one means of production and one means of consumption and the money commodity, then the three value equations in the simplest possible way, in a non-dynamic way, will look something like this. Okay, now basically this is, I am assuming that there is only one technique of production, the standard things one assumes for simplicity again. Uh, okay, now typically one would argue that since the value of commodities should be measured in terms of money, I take money as a numerator. You can skip the mathematical justification. Okay. The surplus value extracted from workers of one type, let's call them type alpha, may be related to the surplus value extracted from, say, other type of workers, say, type beta. And you can put in a coefficient, it's basically xi alpha beta. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is, the xi can be a placeholder for different phenomena connected to oppression. So what I'm trying to say is, by bringing in unequal rates of exploitation, you can bring in social expression, uh, oppression right into the core, I mean, okay, into the uh, discussion of the law of value in Marx. Okay, for, uh, for unequal rates of exploitation to persist, it must be the case that social differences between two or more sections of workers must prevail. Now, we can skip this point because you don't have time. Uh, Wolp is a, was a South African Marxist, as all of you know. Uh, he had said that race is interiorized inside class. That is, the reproduction of class relations involves race in an irreducible way, and vice versa, obviously. But he also goes on to add that because race under certain conditions, I'm quoting here, may be interiorized in the class struggle, it does not follow that all struggles involving race are necessarily class struggles. That's just a Footnote. Okay, now there is, I think, in some cases, Marxists, including Marxist feminists, sometimes overplay their hand. Now, this is a very long quotation, so I'll just uh, draw your attention to the relevant line. Look at this class is identity blind. Far from being an error or a problem in need of correction, this blindness indicates that the logic of class relations, exploitation, and capital accumulation is indifferent to the actual individual characteristics of capitalists and workers. The rest of the quotation, I'm sure you'll have time to read later. What I'm trying to argue here is that this is actually overplaying your hand. You, needn't, you don't have to say this. In the name of setting the priority of class, one doesn't have to leave out the role of social operation, even in the economic domain, in, data, in the definition of class. Okay, uh, so that I've said out. Uh, so, but for workers as a whole, 
the rate of exploitation, the rate of surplus value are equal, but it is not so once we understand there are differences between workers. Okay. Uh, okay. So once we understand how social oppression impacts exploitation, the understanding of these phenomena become more concrete. Okay. Now there is also the question of reproduction of labor power. There is a tradition of writing which has come to be known as social reproduction theory. There is no time to go into the details. So this is basically one attempt to explore the relationship between reproduction of labor power and the accumulation of capital. In terms of the formulation set out in this paper, labor expended on reproducing labor power contributes to the determination of the number of workers, new entrants, as well as part of the cost of reproducing all workers. Similarly, surplus value is not extracted from family labor, primarily expended by women or disproportionately expended by women, but uh, it does contribute to the determination of the value of labor power. Okay. Uh, unequal rates of exploitation may also be relevant to the transformation problem. Uh, Professor Ajit Sinha is not here, so I'll quickly skip through this. Uh, of course, Professor Meghna Desa is there, so I'll quickly, anyway, I'll still go through this very quickly. I believe that following the work of certain Marxists such as Prabhat Patnaik, that if there are some workers who's, who are unable to defend any level of the wage rate, then basically, apart from subsistence, sometimes even below subsistence, real wages can be pushed. Effectively, then I argue, this can play a role in how the transformation problem is set out. Okay. Uh, if, uh, if money is, okay, let's skip this part. So basically, I'll say the simpler version. So if money is not a commodity and you think of the Strafa system, then basically you have N price equations and one rate of profit. So if you assume that uh, there are two types of workers and one of whom cannot defend the real wage, you have an additional variable for which you need an additional equation, which I would argue is the condition set out in Marx as he puts it here, that the sum of surplus value equals the sum of profits. And the condition that total price equal to total value can be a numerator. Okay. Uh, now, since we are dealing with historical materialism, key concepts which you should be concerned with include mode of production and social formation. Now, Lange probably provides the least uh, controversial definition of the mode of production when he says social productive forces and the production relations connected with them and based on a given type of the ownership of the means of production or jointly termed the mode of production. You see, in the University of Delhi, we still teach from Oscar Lange's book because they're not able to agree on a newer book till now. Uh, Althusser had defined a social formation as follows. Every concrete social formation is based on a dominant mode of production. The immediate implication is that in every social formation, there exists more than one mode of production, at least two and often many more. Now, Wolpe and Jessup and others have pointed out that modes of production involve the production of commodities and ideas. But as Wolpe in another writing has pointed out, this does not involve a lapse into subjectivism. Again, no time to take this up. We can come back to it if we have during the questions, if somebody is interested in taking up the point. Okay. Uh, now, Wolpe, what he does, he has a detailed discussion in one of his, actually it's an edited volume in which in the introduction there's a detailed discussion of what he calls the articulation of different modes of production in social formations. In other words, the relations between different modes of production. Now, okay, this is slightly conceptual. So, he dis uh, Wolpe distinguish, uh, distinguishes between features of a mode of production and factors which bring about its reproduction, which may involve other modes of production in a social formation. So he distinguishes between what is known as a restricted and extended concepts of the mode of production, wherein the former involves only the specification of the relations of production and the productive forces, while the latter involves the relations of production, the productive forces and the factors that bring about this reproduction, which may not be the same. On this basis, Wolf suggests there can be three possibilities. A social formation involves two or more productions, uh, modes of production defined restrictively while the factors that reproduce them are external to each restrictly defined mode of production. The second possibility is that social formation involves two or more extended modes of production, but the relation between them is not necessary for the reproduction of any of them. And a third possibility is that a social formation involves one dominant extended mode of production and one or more subordinate restricted modes of production. Here, dominance of an extended mode of production, according to Wolp, is its ability to self-reproduce and that other modes of production are dependent on it for their reproduction. Okay, 
Now, once a sharp conceptual distinction between the restricted and extended definition of modes of production are overcome, because on the one hand that the conditions that bring about a reproduction of a mode of production may influence the character of the productive forces and the relations of production. Think, for example, about the role of racism in capital accumulation in colonial India. And on the other hand, the character of the productive forces and the relations of production may contribute to the process of reproduction of the mode of production. It is now possible to consider the argument of Patnaik, who points out that a capitalist mode of production is not self-contained. If both workers and capitalists are organized, organized, have bargaining power, then steady growth and steady inflation are not possible for high rates of activity, that is the rate of employment and the degree of capacity utilization. Okay. The solution to this problem, according to him, lies in the fact that in the capitalist periphery, there exists a set of workers who share in output can be squeezed since they live amidst a reserve army of labor that is larger than that in the capitalist metropolis. These workers are primary commodity producers or workers employed by metropolitan capital in the periphery. The possibility of workers in the periphery or immigrants or their descendants, think of African Americans in the USA, working in the metropolis has been implicitly considered in the previous discussion. Thus the capitalist mode of production does not eliminate some of the other modes of production. Colonialism was historically necessary in the making of the system, which is imperialism, but is not necessary for its persistence. In a theory of imperialism, the capitalist mode of production in the cap both the capitalist metropolis and the periphery are unequally interdependent, apart from the interdependence between capitalist and non-capitalist modes of production. No time for elaboration, I am sorry. This also implies that a key difference between the capitalist metropolis and the periphery, namely the large ratio of the reserve army of labor, reserve army to the active army of labor, in the latter, never attains that which prevails in the former. It has a much bigger ratio. In different historical periods, some factors that have contributed to this dichotomy between the capitalist metropolis and the periphery include the relative immobility of labor between the two, the relative immobility of productive capital between the two, the limited role of exports of the capitalist periphery to the metropolis, and the price inelastic preferences of the elite in the periphery for the commodities produced in the metropolis. Okay, some of these factors have become less relevant, but it is the case that even though many countries in the capitalist periphery have high rates of output growth, they usually have higher rates of productivity growth, resulting in what we know as jobless growth. Okay, now the argument of Patnaik may be summarized in the following passage. I am quoting, the capitalist mode it follows is both revolutionary and not yet, yet not quite revolutionary enough. Uh, it does break down the ins insulation of existing pre-capitalist societies. It does ruthlessly draw them into the vortex of its own accumulation process, but not necessarily by creating within them, in a dominant form, the structures of the bourgeois mode of production itself. Okay. It follows that the existence of uh, other modes of production in the capitalist periphery is a perennial feature of the socialist, uh, social formation where the capitalist mode of production is dominant. Okay. Uh, now... This is a quotation of Marx, basically where he points out the importance of the way in which surplus is extracted and the form in which it is extracted is a key to understanding the society in which, in the social formation in which one is dealing with. Okay. Uh, the persistence of some types of social operations such as caste in India is connected to the coexistence of some pre-capitalist modes of production in a social formation where the capitalist mode of production is dominant. Discussions of caste which do not take into account its material dimension whereby many members of deprived castes are situated in non-capitalist or pre-capitalist modes of production will necessarily be incomplete. Likewise, one can look at the, ex the example of Muslim community in India as well as women all over the world. And of course, there's a question of race, which I'm less familiar with. Uh, within such a social formation, members of socially oppressed strata, even when they are incorporated within the capitalist mode of production, are often subject to a greater exploitation, which is associated with a host of socially oppressive practices, which are facilitated by the bourgeoisie. The discussion about unequal rates of exploitation now be related to the existence of many modes of production in a social formation. Workers of oppressed strata are subject to greater exploitation both within the capitalist mode of production as well as in other modes of production. The bourgeoisie have a material interest in furthering social oppression both in an immediate sense as well as in a more systemic sense, namely the prevalence of social oppression, and I mean this, is necessary for the establishment and continuance of the capitalist mode of production. You can never have a capitalist mode of production where there is no oppression. That is my claim. Okay, now there is a long quotation from Karl Marx, but since I'm running short of time, I'll just, I'll just 
set out my summary of it, which is the following. The hegemony of the English bourgeoisie, he's, he, this is an 1870 letter he wrote about the Irish and English and the situation there. He says, the I interpret him to be saying, the hegemony of the English bourgeoisie, even over the English workers, was tied up with English colonialism in Ireland. English colonialism in Ireland was a necessary condition for the differences between Irish immigrant workers in England and English workers and this was promoted by the English bourgeoisie and involved a social oppression of the Irish in both Ireland and England. Okay, now my proposal is that the social formation where the capitalist mode of production is dominant may be termed as bourgeoisie. This is the definition and this word has been used, introduced in Marxist capital in actually in the afterword. Bourgeoisie rather than capitalism has been proposed as a moniker for this process since it allows one to deal with propositions such as the following. The capitalist system is much more than the capitalist mode of production analyzed by Marx. Then you don't have to call it capitalism. Uh, likewise, Marx had said a capitalist is only capital personified or it is only capital personified. But the bourgeoisie is a product of a historical process and not merely capital personified. How a concrete instance of bourgeoisie is re reproduced is can only be con covered by historical invitation. I regret that many of the papers presented here had they been made available to me earlier, maybe I could have, you know, incorporated some of their insights in this. Okay, bourgeoisie involves, among other things, two processes. Oppression is necessary for the reproduction of exploitation. No time for elaboration. Likewise, the differential exploitation of the proletariat and the articulation of different modes of production is a necessary condition for the reproduction of social oppression. In other words, oppression and exploitation are two sides of the same coin, if you permit me to apply this simplification. Okay, again, no time to elaborate this. Attempts at a consistent, socially inclusive process of capitalist development un are unrealizable. This may be illustrated as follows. Assume a social formation is composed of two non-class social groups, A and B. I claim that there is no tendency for the two non-class social groups to be proportionally represented among the exploiters and the exploited, and for the time being ignoring other classes. The more oppressed non-class social group is likely to be overrepresented among the exploited. Neither is there any spontaneous tendency in bourgeoisie to overcome this uh, asymmetry, nor is the bourgeoisie going to willingly accede to any such effort. Okay, now if you look at the new version of the party program of the CPIM, which was updated in 2000, it says, the problem of caste oppression and discrimination has a long history and is deeply rooted in the pre-capitalist social system. The society under capitalist development has compromised with the existing caste system. The Indian bourgeoisie itself fosters caste prejudices, which I think is substantially different from the formulation in 1964. Thus, while one may endorse the proposition advanced by Wolpe that apartheid was not necessary for the persistence of capitalism, i.e. bourgeoisie in South Africa, I claim that social oppression along racial lines or any other social grounds is necessary for the reproduction of bourgeoisie. The spontaneous tendency under bourgeoisie is for the reproduction of the proletariat as a partly fragmented and exploited class along with other exploited class and socially oppressed strata. Okay, again there is no time to go over this. So I claim uh, that the revolutionary proletariat, okay, without combating oppression and exploitation in struggles, the revolutionary proletariat cannot come into existence. Since exploitation and oppression are linked under bourgeoisie, it is not possible to combat one while disregarding the other. An inability to sustain the combined struggle against oppression and exploitation will result in an unraveling of the revolutionary proletariat. A successful transcending of bourgeoisie, while it may be more complex than previously conceived due to factors such as those discussed in this paper, it remains historically relevant and significant. Do I have time? You do have time. Okay. So quickly, a certain analogy, again this is again specific to political economy, so I'll skip this. Class, uh, caste, gender, race are organically inter interrelated, they presuppose each other. This does not involve a deep prioritization of class, but a more concrete understanding of the role of class within the framework of historical materialism. No specific formulation on the concrete link between class, race, gender, caste, etc. in any concrete social formation has been advanced in this paper because the, you need other people to do this. That process can only follow from historical inquiry in good concrete social formations such as Indian bourgeoisie. Some questions that may be motivated by this paper include, 
concrete investigations of the relationship between oppression and exploitation in different social formations and how they may have changed over time. And secondly, what were the modes of production? I'm looking to historians here in pre-colonial India and specifically what was the relationship between exploitation and oppression? Thank you. Now have, we will now hear from, let's see, Dr. Spencer Leonard, who uh, has several times today allowed me to argue with him, so I welcome him here to hear his presentation, and um, I look forward to the look forward to it. He is a scholar of history of imperialism and anti-imperialism, especially for the period 1757 through 1876, and he's currently a visiting. Uh, he's in a visiting position at the University of Tennessee. Uh, he has also, he has recently edited a, vol a volume of Marx's journalism from the 1850s entitled Marx and Angles on Imperialism and a volume of scholarly papers from a conference held in Bombay in 2017 on the legacy of Mount Stewart, Eliphas Stone, in uh, Elephant Stone in Central and South Asia. Uh, he also has a project in hand, a short book on Karl Marx and the English socialist responses, response to the debates surrounding the renewal of the East India Company's charter in 1853. Um, and in the long term, he is working on, on a book entitled Adam Smith in Calcutta. So I will. Um, turn the floor over to him to talk about his paper for today. Thank you, uh, Lal Salam. Uh, I want to dedicate uh, this paper to, uh, this is the, to my recently deceased uh, advisor, Moshe Stone. I also want to thank all the organizers of this conference for their generous invitation the opportunity to return to India, to see my family and friends here, and the opportunity to address you all. I also want to, ho to thank the hotel workers and staff, both inside the air conditioning and outside, who have cooked, cleaned, and generally made my stay here so accommodating. Uh, this is not really a, a research paper. First of all, I'm going to integrate some responses uh, to the conference so far and and then really talk about the or, or draw upon the introduction that I'm writing to a volume of Marx's journalism from the 1850s uh, which is organized around the theme of Bonapartism it's entitled Marx and Engels on Imperialism 1851 to 1862. Responding to the conference so far, a couple of things. First of all, to echo something said at the outset of this conference, we mustn't allow ourselves to be deceived, to be so deceived as to imagine that we are in any sense living at present through a renaissance of Marxism. The phrase Marxist academic itself contains a contradiction First of all, the university has been conservative for at least 175 years, ever since the young Dr. Marx, the admittedly most brilliant of the, most y of the young Hegelians, was denied a job in Germany in the 1840s. Uh, very arguably, the last revolutionary university professor was Hegel, despite the accusations of his being conservative. Uh, there have been, of course, Marxist university professors, such as Herbert Marcuse and Adorno and many others, uh, but they wrote from the margins of the university and they did so in a manner that thematized their recognition, that it was no less possible to be an intellectual outside the party than it was to be inside the party in their day. They knew Cathedral Socialismus to be an impossibility. 
the notion of the leftist academic, of course, was made possible when the new left, which retreated into the university in the 1970s and 80s, forgot that that move into the university was a retreat. Marxism can only flourish in society, among intellectuals seeking a mass audience, whether through the party political press, journalism more broadly, or simply as a writer who lives by writing in some other uh, mode of publication. Uh, the ruling class won't set up revolutionary intellectuals with tenure and research funds. By all means, let us do our day jobs and earn our living in the classroom, uh, but let's not delude ourselves into believing that the work that needs doing is the research that will gain us promotion. Speaking as intellectuals and not as academics, and surely Marx demands this of us, there is no Marx revival. One of the ADRI people who spoke at the outset of the conference, I believe it was Dr. Ghosh, I'm sorry I don't recall, I didn't know everyone's name at that time, uh, said that the 150th birthday celebrations in 1968 were more impressive than the 200th, which I suspect is putting it mildly. And we should recall that Marx's 100th birthday was celebrated in a still more appropriate manner by attempting communist revolution in Germany, the consequences of which defeat and of, the subsequent, and of subsequent defeats remain with us to this day. And let us remember finally that the German revolution itself could only ever have succeeded had it provoked socialist revolution on a global scale. As for the Marxist scholarship of our time, it seems to me that what we see today is the final playing out of the last major upsurge of revolutionary politics, albeit an ultimately failed and directionless upsurge, the new left of the 1960s and 70s. What we celebrate today as advances in scholarship is the working out of the Marx revival of the 1970s old scholars writing out the texts and arguments they conceived in their revolutionary youth. As Kohai Saito stated last night, the Marxists of a prior generation are not being replaced, and as Peter Beilharts mentioned, the university itself is being hollowed out. Uh, to this I would add that it is being hollowed out not only by retrograde neoliberal policies, but by a generation of professors who no longer believe in themselves, even as regards uh, basic cultivation and humanistic education. Something I recognized some five years ago when a student of mine uh, mentioned to me that the Shakespeare class they were enrolled in had been turned by their professor into a seminar on Derrida and Heidegger. While is it, it is at least arguable that students are hungry to learn about Marxism and indeed modern art and intellectualism as a whole, it must be said with few exceptions, the brightest young people today vote with their feet by seeking out technical, vocational, and other manifestly unintellectual, even anti-intellectual courses of study in higher education. But they are too young to be blamed Rather, their disinterest is the plainest indication of the collapse of the liberal arts. The crisis of the left stems from the failure of the 1960s new left to actually reconstitute Marxism or any genuine successor to it. A fact that left the entire project of freedom and thus of culture as a whole in crisis. Our problem is not, as was suggested in the talk yesterday, the cell phone, but the fact that we no longer have anything to say to one another. In terms of, the Marxist, schol of Marxist scholarship in the world today, the essential circumstance is no different in Australia than it is in South America, because the circumstance, as Marx would be the first to tell us, is historical, not geographical. If there isn't a left in America, Japan, Germany, in Aus or Australia, there isn't going to be one in India or Venezuela either. It may be morning or night in one or another place on Earth, but historically speaking, 
It is one moment. Because history is made by our species as a whole, on a, on a world scale, and though history might die, might indeed already be dead, history never sleeps. Let us hope that historically speaking, this is the time of the death of socialism globally, because in that case, some successor to Marxism might be born. The, the, death is, the left is dead, long live the left. But it's questionable whether we can say even this much, since history is intelligible only as freedom. And what is clear is that the great struggle for human freedom that first realized itself in bourgeois society in the bourgeois revolutions of the 17th and 18th century, the struggle that later entered into crisis with the rise of socialism as heir to the enlightenment under conditions of capital, that is to say, after the industrial revolution, the entire project stretching from 1649 to 1917 has collapsed as have the 20th century's attempt to revive it. Speaking for my own generation, our tragedy is that we failed to overcome the new left in the way that they did the old left. On the occasion of Marx's 200th birthday, we mustn't forget that on his 100th, as I've said, world revolution was halted and turned back at the Brandenburg Gate. And history is yet to recover. Sick with its own unrealized potential, society regresses and disintegrates. And the stench of its own decomposition forces us not only to hold our nose, but alas, to cover our eyes and ears. The real purpose of our screens and headphones, as well as our academic volumes, is to render us blind and deaf to experience the only possible school from which we might truly learn how to read Marx, which of course we may end up doing on a screen or via our headphones. The immediate ta task of our time is to recover the past that the present might be experienced if only as the product of historic defeats. Rosa Luxemburg wrote in her last piece of writing, the whole road of socialism, so far as revolutionary struggles are concerned, is paved with nothing but thunderous defeats. Yet at the same time, history marches inexorably, step by step, toward final victory. Where would we be today without those defeats? from which we draw historical experience, understanding, power, and idealism. What an optimist was Rosa Luxemburg. Our problem is that we lack for defeats. So the essential point is this, history alone can make history intelligible. There can be no Marx revival without we face the unprecedented crisis we're confronted with and reconstitute taking the very ashes of the 20th century for our raw material, the worldwide struggle for socialism. Because a specter is haunting Europe, and we are all Europeans, the specter of communism's failure. Marxism was the high water mark of humanity's freedom struggle and the site of that struggle's greatest, yet seemingly irrevocable defeat. This is why last year passed over the centenary of 1917 with embarrassed silence. But in 1917, the subject of this conference, Karl Marx, could be summoned to historically defeat his would-be revisionists. Today, like the Bolshevik Revolution, which taught the world his name, Marx weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living which is odd in its way, as, is, as Marx is, after all, a kindly bourgeois. For his birthday, he asks for no other acknowledgement than that we endeavor to make mankind again worthy of happiness. On last night's panel, Michael Bree pointed out that Marx's politics is sadly neglected in the so-called Marx boom of the present time. This is not incidental, of course. Because to say that is to say there is no Marx boom, 
there being no aspect of Marx's writings or activity that is not political, revolutionary, from first to last. His so-called economics and his supposed social theory included. Nothing can be salvaged for our disciplines from the wreck of Marxism. We would do better to simply try to clear away the obstacles to knowing what Marxism was and indeed why it was called, very strangely, Marxism. With this, I propose here to at least attempt to reconstruct certain conditions of possibility for understanding the orthodox Marx. What revolutionary Marxism, which is to say, what Lenin, Luxembourg, and Trotsky and their philosophical expressions, Lukács, Korsh, Horkheimer, Adorno, meant when they spoke of Marx, when they said the word theory. We would do well to achieve the understanding of Marx that Marxism itself achieved, the understanding of Marx that the greatest revolutionary Marxist achieved. In the short time that remains, I'll do so by concentrating on the understanding of Marx achieved by the first Marxists. Marx and Engels themselves. I should say that these reflections derive from the introduction I'm currently writing to an edited volume of Marx's journalism from the 1850s. Writings that have been hopelessly obscured by claims that in them Marx is somehow talking about places or peoples, about India, China, France, Britain, or America. No, Marx's object is never concrete. To take those most familiar to this audience, Marx's writings on India are not about India. They're about imperialism in the sense of Bonapartism. And if we're forced by today's nationalists to answer the charge of Eurocentrism, we must frankly confess that the Bonapartist global state was in Marx's times, as in ours, politically centered in Europe. Marx was uninterested in revol revolutionizing the world as it should be, but sought instead to bring the world as it should be into being. Marx's writings on the 1853 East India Company's charter renewal and the 1857 Indian Revolt are about the collapse into contradiction, and to the extent that that contradiction is unrecognized, the vulgarization of bourgeois society and bourgeois thought. Specifically, Marx's writings on 1853, which neither Edward Said nor Kevin Anderson understand, are about the self-contradiction under conditions of capital of the bourgeois aspiration to global cosmopolitan society and the related bourgeois aspiration to anarchy, that is to say, to self-regulating society. The simple proposition I want to put forward here is that Marx's claim to our attention is that he was the philosopher of the 19th century revolution. To specify further, he was the philosopher of 1848. Marx is the great critic of social democracy. It is as such that he can still be said to be the most important, perhaps not despite, but because he is the least recoverable thinker of our time. Because the 19th century is not yet over, or we fervently pray that the 20th century didn't swallow it whole. The best birthday present we could give Marx is to transform him from being important to being relevant precisely in order that he might finally be forgotten. Marx and, Eng and Eng even Engels never fully imagined because they never fully witnessed Marxism as the historical force that it became in the first decades of the 20th century. But they did become aware and began to specify the originary significance of their own thinking when they confronted the 19th century for themselves in 1848. It was in reflecting upon that experience that Marx recognized the nature and necessity of his own project. It was in 1848 that Marx became a Marxist and knew it. 
And 1848 had, it, had its precursors. Marx was not wholly unprepared for the revolution to which his name is forever linked. In, in 1839, when Marx was 21, the greatest proletarian leader on, of the age on the continent, Auguste Blanqui, attempted with the assistance of the League of the Just an armed uprising in Paris. Just as one month later, the English Chartists presented their monster uh, petition to the House of Commons, and as later that same year there broke out in Wales the great Newport Uprising. More directly experienced by Marx and Engels, or at least more directly reflected upon, was five years later the Silesian Weavers Uprising of 1844, which is to say smack in the middle of Marx's breathless political and intellectual development in the years leading up to 1848. But there can be no doubt that the galloping, geographically widespread, and above all, uh, novel events of the revolution of 1848 occasioned the one transformation as opposed to simple development or refinement in Marx's thinking, the one that set the agenda for the rest of his life. As Marx notes, the revolution of 1848 did not undergo, as perhaps he expected, a regular, so to speak, textbook course of development. Indeed, the revolution of 1848 revealed that an unheard of fiasco was in store for the revolution. If, as Louis Menand remarked some years ago, Marx and Engels were philosophes of a second enlightenment, that is because the first enlightenment had come to crisis. That crisis, that freedom contradiction, was phenomenally manifested by the emergence of the socialist workers' movement, ultimately in the attempt at social democratic revolution. Unlike the great French Revolution, to take the most salient example, the proletarian revolution could not succeed in spite of its defeats. It needed its defeats, but it needed its defeats in order to succeed. Eventually, Marx was to give a name to bourgeois freedom's historical crisis, and that name was capital. Capitalism as context demanded the renewal and supersession of bourgeois ideology. As Professor, Professor Mishra mentioned on the first day of our conference, democracy is the political expression of capital. If you would be so kind. But, ma but capital manifested itself as the problem of proletarian revolution. Capitalism's only resource for its own regeneration is the democratic discontent that it itself generates. Capitalism must be understood ultimately as a product of politics. This is what Rosa Luxemburg reasserted a year, a century, a half a century later in her polemic against Bernstein. This is the heart of the critique of revisionism. To overcome capital, it is necessary to work through its modes of appearance. Marx characterized capitalism politically. He outlined the problem of what he would later call the fetishism of commodities, uh, mere uh, actually weeks after Louis Bonaparte's coup d'etat. He did so by evoking the myth of Hercules and Antaeus. And no, just to wind up. Bourgeois revolutions like those of the 18th century storm swiftly from success to success. Their dramatic effects outdo each other. Men and things seem set in sparkling brilliance. Ecstasy is the everyday spirit. They are short-lived. Soon they have attained their zenith. And a long, crapulent depression lays hold of society before it learns soberly to assimilate the results of its storm and stress, period. On the other hand, proletarian revolutions like those of the 19th century criticize themselves constantly, interrupt themselves continually in their own course, come back to apparently accomplished, to what is apparently accomplished in order to begin afresh, 
deride with unmerciful thoroughness the inadequacies, weaknesses, and paltrinesses of their first attempts, seem to throw down their adversary only in order that he may draw new strength from the earth and rise again, more gigantic before them, recoil ever and anon from the indefinite prodigiousness of their own aims until a situation has been created which makes all turning back impossible. Marx, responses, Marx and Engels' response to and digestion of this experience consumed the rest of their lives. And there was, as above all, Lenin, Luxembourg, and Trotsky recognized, in digesting 1848, Marx founded Marxism. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, four questions. May we take a few questions? Uh, so let's see. Um, we have one in the front and one in the back. Second one on the third. A third one on the side here. Yeah, hello. Uh, my question is to Babak. Uh, thanks a lot. It was very insightful. Uh, I have a specific question with respect to the slide which showed about the economist narrative which was changing from one spectrum to a completely different level of spectrum. But do you think that uh, rather than, I mean, for most part I agree, but basically I'm trying to be a devil's advocate, that rather than blaming, say, an institution like economist, uh, I think they are able to take this kind of liberty because of the prevalent anti-intellectualism in the society, which for most part is also a manifestation and reflection of the failure of academics and the people who pursued uh, Marxists from a theoretical and academic standpoint. So for example, uh, the college students, even the, when they are attending the colleges where there's an, still an environment of uh, about the ideas of Marxism, they are not able to do justice with these ideas with their students. Like for example, uh, or we, if you talk about the print media, uh, now Guardian has a much higher or a bigger platform to talk about these notions, but it fails to do the justice with these ideas. If I talk about labor, uh, Jeremy Corbyn increasingly is defensive than being more proactive in pursuing the ideas of Marx. So rather than uh, uh, saying that it's a failure or a reflection of a stupidity of economists, does it, does, is it fair to say that it is a manifestation of anti-intellectualism and incompetence of the people who have pursued the ma ideas of Marx from an academic standpoint? Thank you. I think since we have different, um, well, we can go ahead and take our, take our first four questions. Um, it will be the lady thanks in the back. Uh, thanks a lot to all the speakers for the presentations. I have a question for Sarat Chand. Um, and I really liked your presentation and attempt to link interplays between class and social oppression to actual value appropriation. And I think it's a very important uh, conversation to have. I wonder if you do engage at all with new debates on uh, super exploitation, that an attempt to actually do this. And I'm uh, specifically referring to the work of John Smith in imperialism in the 21st century and the work of Andy Higginbottom as well. And so in a sense, it's like, is it an argument of uh, social oppression then uh, being linked to differential modes of surplus appropriation or a, all different modes. And uh, Ben Selwyn puts it in, in relation to his uh, um, uh, uh, discussions on immiseration. Uh, and related to that, if you benefit at all from debates on liberal freedom, which have been also mobilized to try to sort of uh, talk about these relations uh, in ways that give justice both to class but also to raise gender and other forms of social oppression without uh, having to sort of uh, put uh, a primacy of one category over the others. Thank you. Um, actually, I'd like to go ahead and answer those two questions because they're relatively complicated. Let, let us do two at a time. Yes, sure. Um, 
Uh, thanks for your question. Um, so I have to qualify that point. It was meant to be a joke, and more than a, you know, a sophisticated analysis of uh, what's happening in uh, you know, the conservative media, obviously. But <clears throat> you know, uh, about your greater point, uh, I think there is some truth in that, although um, we have to look at the, the, the cultural role of, uh, say, the economists in forming uh, the ideas and opinions of its readers, right, uh, over, over years. And That, that is true. Like, uh, in terms of the counter hegemonic sort of movement to um, oppose those uh, forces, that is, you know, we, we need a lot, we have a lot of room to, for improvement. But um, the fact that, you know, they, they are starting to incorporate or at least, you know, have a relatively sympathetic kind of take on some of these opinions or some of these ideas seems to be a reflection of a greater sort of reception of. Uh, so Marx's ideas at the popular level. Of course, we can talk about how deep those things are, etc. But it's, it to, seems to me is a reflection of something that is happening either in the universities or in the popular culture at large. Yeah, uh, uh, two questions. One is about super exploitation. Now, there has been a tradition in political economy about arguing that there has been transfer of value between countries. Now, that's the international dimension. That may have been significant during the colonial period and some Marxist political economists argue even now to a certain extent. But you know, what I feel is that exploitation, exchange comes later. First, when you start with exploitation, you're looking at unequal rates of exploitation. Now, the, since I was not privy to the papers presented here and other literature, actually I'm looking to other people who are more familiar with this to try and make me understand what is happening. Once I understand, I'll be probably able to say something more significant about how actually this, if you look, I de-emphasize the equations, I have not specified any particular formulation. Because I think that people like me need to understand first. Second is, what about labor and freedom? See, what happens is now, uh, within a formal model, bringing in labor and freedom is an issue. But uh, if you're thinking about how caste, gender, race, etc., makes make workers unfree, then we'll have to try and quantify that. See, typically Marx argued in terms of the duration of labor, working day, uh, the intensity of labor, the productivity of labor. If you're talking of worker being unfree in some sense, then if you want to bring it into the th law of value, you'll have to try to quantify it. Again, I think it requires political economists and Marxists from other areas to actually work together to come up with some meaningful formulation. We had a question on the left. Do you have a mic? Um, and then I think we have Lord Desai. This question, someone raised their hand first round. Gentleman in blue? Yes, I think. Um, Hello. Thanks. My question is to Novajuk Gill. Uh, towards the later part of your presentation, you brought out this contrast between the expropriation of the British peasantry through enclosure movements and what actually happened in the Punjab, where you, where you portrayed that the process was almost the opposite of it. Uh, enclosure and displacement, rather they were divided in particular ways, uh, which rooted them to, this, to, to, the, to the landed property and made them responsible for payment of revenue. Now, my first question is, my first point is, why did you, you were trying to pose a contrast between the Punjab experience and the European experience, and why uh, you concentrated only on the British experience. If you look at the French peasantry, they did not go through any such expropriation. On the contrary, the French 
peasantry uh, entered into uh, relations with the absolutist monarchy in France. So th this was by no means a universal paradigm. The second point is that even though at the outset you do not have uh, enclosure and eviction, not all processes of primitive accumulation take place directly. If you look at the work by Perelman, Burawai, and De Angelis and others, which I'm sure you have, they argue that it can take place in indirect ways. Uh, for example, uh, other processes which are not necessarily directed at evicting peasants can eventually lead to that. Very concretely, in the case of Punjab, do you have any evidence that the setting up of these differentials between the elite groups paying revenue and the other peasants was, all, all, was also linked to differential uh, abilities to perform in the market? In other words, whether market-based differentiation in the long run could have led to a polarization among the Punjab peasantry. So this kind of indirect processes do not take place immediately. But if one has the theoretical apparatus to look at it, you could actually say that this was not necessarily an immediate outcome, but it, it was a kind of unintended consequence of the changes introduced by British rule. Shall we answer first, or would you like to? My question is also about what Navyu mm -hmm. Gil said. One thing has already been covered by Shaban Adnan, i.e. that uh, the last part of Capital Volume 1 is utterly irrelevant to your, your thing. You, you, mustn't, you mustn't set up Marx as such a model that everything has to follow that. Uh, even if it was, uh, the British were not trying to start capitalism in India. Uh, so why, why would they, why would they <laughs> kick air to follow uh, uh, you know, part eight? But more important than that, I think you said something about the way they kept the accounts of different lands and so on. You know, they were following a long tradition which already had been established in India. I mean, British themselves made detailed accounts every region they took on. They, because they had this idea that there's a huge amount of land revenue to be raised in India. Uh, and that's going to finance everything. And I have seen the Gujarat records. And they're very meticulous, very detailed. And they, they are just, they're not, not a priori, nothing like that. And this is the empirical tradition. And the, your local settlement officer knew how circumstances changed. So once they had written it down, they would know how it changed. So I think you have to do more justice to the settlement, uh, to, to these officers than you're doing. Because they were not stupid. They really cared about how much revenue they collected. And they wanted more revenue to be collected. Okay, if there are maybe two more questions, and uh, then we will go back for the answers. Um, yes, I, I think that's one. And anybody else? I'm actually, I'm not going to spend <coughs> time responding to your Eurocentrism, because I think it's obvious to everybody here how severe that is and how extremely problematic it is. Uh, I can't help not to respond, though, to your comment that democracy is the political expression of capital which is bad enough because it's a Stalinist conception, but to couple it with Rosa Luxemburg's legacy, a word that simply has to be said here. Rosa Luxemburg spent her life fighting for revolutionary democracy, and the last year of her life, of course, sharply critiquing Lenin and Trotsky, who you couple with her, unproblematically, for the suppression of revolutionary workers' democracy after the seizure of power in 1918. So just for the record, I want to make it very clear that there is no historical content to this claim to try to throw Rosa Luxemburg, of all people, into this category of those who view democracy as nothing more than the political expression of capital, which also, of course, logically presumes that the transcendence of capital, should that ever happen, would mean the abolition of democracy. Can we get one more question? And I think uh, you're up. Okay. 
Thank you. I, uh, I mean, I have a question and a comment uh, very quickly. I'll start with the comment. Um, the comment is for uh, Baba, but I'll go to Spencer's point that uh, Marx, I mean, yesterday in my presentation I said uh, Marxism that circulated through Kolkata was not the philosophy of Marx, it was a, a, a credo. Uh, that's considering the, the, the philosopher that is Marx being portrayed after uh, the circulation of Marx. Uh, but if we consider Marx as a philosopher of 1848, as Spencer was him, um, then this is the philosophy circulating. And how this is circulating, I started to um, book history um, methods like bibliographic methods, tracking bibliography, taking censuses, and also text critical method. It didn't go very far. Why? Uh, one example I have shown yesterday is um, there was such a thing, such a barrier called colonial administration and their prescription and their getting those books back by court order and whatnot. There was a hilarious story. There was other part to it. The hierarchy within the left. The German ideology, when the book was published in 1932, it was not... Um, for language purposes, it was not accessible, but it was also prescribed. But then when the English translation was published in 1944, uh, the English translation was available. Then, if you look at the first edition, it says left book club edition, not for sale to the public. So, could you what make sure to keep that mic close for us, please? What I uh, get there is uh, barriers at different levels. It's, it's not just um, what kind of text is disseminating, it's also why not it's disseminating. So, I mean, uh, going through this uh, debate of whether or not Marxism was philosophy of Marx, I can tell you what I ended up, I started with what you have said, dissemination of politics, at least part of it. I ended up with the opposite, uh, the turnover, politics of dissemination. Right. So, Thank you. Um, that's my comment there. The question was for Nabiyu Gil. Nabiyu, um, the colonial benevolence, the way you have theorized it, you have understood it, great, it opens up new door. I'll give you one example, Charles Metcalf, the uh, revenue officer at, uh, in Punjab, what he is claiming is revolutionary, not only benevolent, it's revolutionary. He is saying that Jamindari and permanent settlement system has ruined the riots. We need to take care of the riots. Right? Their, their benefits. I mean, we need to do a settlement at their level. And uh, the Raithwari settlement that happened in southern India didn't work. So what we gonna do? We have to go through the local customs, local records, as uh, uh, Lord Desai has mentioned, very meticulously following the traditions. And it, this is not just, uh, not just Benevolence, it's also a revolutionary claim of modernizing the revenue system. So, would it if, if, if that is be so, possible to go towards an answer here? Um, so that if, if that is so, then the question is w when does this benevolence stop? 1947? Or in the land revenue system, land revenue uh, settlements that we see after independence? Or is it going still? Today, that's the question. When does colonial benevolence stop? When does colonial stop? When is post-colonial? Okay, so we have two questions for Gil. Yeah, three, I think. Let me uh, quickly try to respond. I, I really appreciate the questions. I think um, we learn more from the questions than our answers. So, uh, so I, let me see what I can get to here. Uh, to to Chopin's points, um, yeah, so absolutely the enclosure movements and the uh, 
uh, in England um, are, are what I'm discussing here, um, but why the contrast with the British experience? Um, so I'm not contrasting the situation in colonial Punjab with the situation in uh, England in the 17th or 18th century. I'm contrasting uh, colonial Punjab with the narrative of accumulation that is derived from the experiences of England. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, historians of England have, have shown that it's actually quite different than what Marx describes. Um, Marx himself actually mentions in a footnote the reason why he's using the English example is arbitrary. It's because he has access to the archives of that period. And it could have been France, it could have been something else. Uh, so he says, I happen to have access to these records and that's why I'm writing this, this story of so-called accumulation. I think in the span of two or three pages he says the word so-called a half a dozen times. Um, so my angle then is, if Marx is writing Capital in the 1850s and 1860s in London, what would happen if Marx was sitting in Lahore at the same time? Those chapters would be different. And so that's the contrast. It's not with England, but it's with the narrative of accumulation that is derived from England. Um, the second question, um, it's not identical across the world. I agree completely. Um, and it does lead to not a deferral or a delayed kind of dispossession, but what I'm doing in this chapter is setting up the stage for exploring the new kind of dispossession and disenfranchisement of the landless laborer. That's the other side of the story. I wasn't able to get to here. That's, that's in the other chapters of the book. Um, there's no such thing as landlessness in the 16th century because there's no such thing as landed. The notion that certain castes and certain groups by their biology are hereditary landholders is a new idea. Now, this emerges under colonial rule. And that corresponds to saying other groups are inherently landless. Kammis, village servants, menials. Um, and I guess we're all aware of the situation in Punjab today. Uh, it has the highest proportion of Dalits in the entire country, uh, 31, 32 percent. And the majority of them work as landless laborers. Um, and when you go to the countryside and ask why, why, this, why this is the case, these people do the work of a peasant, yet they're not called peasants, people say, this is just how it is. And it's always been this way. So what I'm trying to challenge is the kind of naturalization of landlessness and landedness. Um, to, to Dr. Desai's point, um, yeah, so what I'm actually responding to um, is actually the scholarship on benevolence and generosity and, and, and moderation. That's the, that's the reason why I'm using these chapters, right? It's because so much of the scholarship on Punjab is precisely that the colonial state was generous. This is dove, dovetails with Prashanto's question. It didn't initiate change. Huh? It, was, it built canal colonies. It recruited people into the military. Um, and so with that non-change, it kind of solidified some kind of a feudalism. Now, implicated in the word feudalism is this stagism, that one day we're supposed to get out of feudalism and go to capitalism. Uh, what I'm saying is what I see in the countryside, it's not feudalism. Um, and it's not the bourgeois mode of production. Uh, I think it's our duty to try to understand what that is. Um, and so if it doesn't fit, then, then we have the work of kind of explaining it. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to kind of talk about a rule of capital, maybe not capitalism. And I agree that these revenue officers, they weren't stupid. Uh, they were meticulous. They were you know, tedious even. Uh, but they were also bumbling around and making exaggerations and committing all sorts of violence in this process of classification and, and documentation and, and fixing people. Um, so I, I don't have like a moral position on them. I, I, don't, you know, I don't care what, you know, my, my feelings towards them are kind of irrelevant, but I'm looking at what they did and the kind of power of writing these things down and reshaping social and economic relations. Last thing I'll quickly say to Prashanto, uh, yeah, it's absolutely that. This is the kind of uh, uh, you know, transformation that is claimed, that we learned our lessons from the permanent settlement. We learned you know, from, from the Zamindari settlement. Here we're going to do things differently and we're going to be generous. We're going to recruit them into the military. We're going to give them land tenure for the first time. Who are you giving land tenure to and how? That's something new. That's implicated in caste. That's implicated in religion. That creates the hereditary peasant for the first time in history in Punjab. And it doesn't, it doesn't end. <laughs>
Perhaps. Well, perhaps. Um, I think the next comment was directed, is it to Leonard? Yeah. Um, Spencer Leonard. About Eurocentrism. I mean, this is a charge that emerges in an age of anti-Marxism, basically, uh, at the end of the 20th century from nationalists like Said. Um, Marxism spread throughout Asia in 1917 in one of the most dramatic cases of dissemination uh, that world history has ever seen. And it wasn't because the Asians didn't recognize that Marx or Marxism was Eurocentric. Right? They recognized Marx and Marxism as a voice of emancipation. And the other thing to say about it is that we have to take Marx's revolutionary project seriously. Marx sought to make a revolution in his own lifetime. So not only is it you know, the second international circumstance where socialism only exists in Europe and North America, it exists even more narrowly. Marx wanted to make a revolution before socialism ever existed in Russia. Uh, it would have certainly been a Eurocentric revolution. He talks about the fact that, um, you know, well, what will this mean if we make a revolution here in Europe and other countries are just beginning to develop bourgeois social relations? Might not counter-revolution be organized from China? He writes that to Engels. Um, so, you know, just in terms of thinking about the geography of revolution, that's what he's thinking about. He's thinking about where is the socialist revolutionary uh, movement in the world. About democracy. Um, democracy is a form of state, right? It's not about uh, being opposed to, you know, solving, you know, resolving conflict by consensus or discussion or debate. Um, democracy arises under capitalism because for the first time in history uh, a class of people has no claim on society and demand the right to vote because they're systematically expelled from society. The uh, the question of unemployment and the threat of unemployment is obviously at the heart of the demand for universal suffrage and the demand for national workshops in France, in Paris, in 1848, right? And, of course, Louis Bonaparte was elected by universal... His coup, he was elected by universal suffrage to be president. After his coup, he was held another universal suffrage election, and of course he held another universal suffrage election later in the 1850s. So Marx is a critic of universal suffrage democracy, and he shares the dream of the Enlightenment, which is to live in a world without a state, a form of self-regulating social life. He is he shares the goal, as Lenin rightly argues in State and Revolution, with anarchism. And anarchy is not democracy. It is a society in which the state, which is the badge of our slavery in the whole of prehistory, to be governed by force, will be abolished. And instead, you would have the rule of you know, forms of public reason uh, in, you know, m that would be the modality by which a self-regulating society would exist. Uh, would that sometimes involve tallying people? Yes. Uh, but it would not be, uh, you know, essentially government by the majority. And we have to say that the proletariat has never been the majority in the world. It's scarcely ever been the majority in a handful of countries. And arguably, uh, its proportion of the population will only decrease with automation, right? 
democracy is an appeal to the uh, lumpen elements in society, to petty bourgeois elements in society, and so forth and so on. So Marx, in talking about proletarian socialism, is not, strictly speaking, uh, talking about democracy, except with reference to Chartism in England. And he makes that distinction explicitly. He says, well, maybe in England you could elect, you know, via uh, democracy, you could achieve socialism. But in other countries, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to do that, certainly not in France in 1848. Um, as for Rosa Luxemburg, uh, and I'll be brief, um, I think Rosa Luxemburg was an orthodox Marxist. Uh, what I was simply trying to do with Rosa Luxemburg is she doesn't have to be, um, you know, what I was doing with her had nothing to do with the part of the argument that you're objecting to, uh, but rather uh, simply to say that um, in Reform and Revolution, she makes the point that you can reform, that in and through reforms, capitalism is deepened as a problem. That cap reform doesn't overcome capitalism, it's the only way through which we can develop politically, but we can become tied to capitalism precisely through reform. And uh, that's the only point that I was trying to make, uh, alongside, of course, the issue of, of, of learning from defeat. You go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I agree with your comment. I don't know if it was meant as a criticism because it seems to me as, uh, that um, I absolutely tried in a methodological sense to say that uh, we have to see translation as politics and politics as translation. So they're already sort of uh, taps into the, uh, the, the, the distinctions that you mentioned within institutions and the fact, you know, the questions such as why a text is not translated might be as, as important as why a text is translated. So I, unless I missed uh, your comment, I think we are on the same page in that. So I'd like to thank everybody for for coming out to this panel. And um, I think we had some really exciting papers with some interesting uh, contrast and approach. So thank you very much, and we're finished here. Thank you, Professor Hewitt. And I request uh, Dr. Sunita Lal to present the memento to all our speakers.